Okay, let them know you're starting the broadcast. All right, mute yourself. so the broadcast is starting. So give yourself mute yourself, we're live. So you'll see you are live and then um, you go ahead and start speaking. Give myself. Ready? Hello, everyone, and welcome to our breakout session on the public management track um, for a vision for Yali's future. My, my name is Makani Tungara. I am the senior advisor in the Africa Bureau at USAID. And I'm very excited to be here with Henry Pacific Mayala, um, a Yali alum. Uh, who is my distinguished panelist for our panel today. Um, just so you know the structure of today's session, um, you know, I'll do some brief introductions and then we will um, have some brief opening remarks. But our goal here today is to make this an interactive session and to get ideas from you about the future of the public management track uh, for the YALI RLCs. And, um, and what's possible given the incredible network um, of individuals that are part of, of the YALI <clears throat> alumni and, and the YALI network. So we really look forward to having your thoughts and ideas uh, in the chat and to make this an interactive exercise uh, and to highlight some of the greatest opportunities um, and thinking um, from all of you today. So welcome. Um, just to give a bit of, of background on myself and then I'll introduce Henry. Um, I started uh, with the Biden-Harris administration in February and I'm very excited to be uh, supporting Africa policy uh, on the continent. Um, prior to that, I spent almost a couple of years running the Leaders Africa program at the Obama Foundation and uh, supporting uh, capacity building for, for young African leaders. Um, but my previous life was in economic development uh, working for a nonprofit called TechnoServe and designing economic development programs uh, globally. Uh, but I also spent three of those years based in Accra and um, working to expand TechnoServe's portfolio across West Africa. Um, I, I am American, but I am also proudly African. My father is from Côte d'Ivoire and I spent my early childhood in Abidjan. And so, um, you know, working uh, on Africa policy and young people on the continent is, is a true passion of mine. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Henry. He has over seven years of experience in research and humanitarian work. Um, he worked most recently as a social scientist researcher at UNICEF, where he focused on explaining trends in the Ebola response in North Kivu and Ituri in Eastern DRC. Prior to UNICEF, Henry worked in the International NGO Safety Organization, INSO, uh, an international organization safeguarding humanitarian aid workers. There he applied uh, GIS approaches to understand and communicate conflict and safety issues in the Eastern DRC. Um, he served as both a Mandela Washington Fellowship Regional Advisory Board member and as an advisor to the subsequent 2018 board. So he was in 2017 and 2018 board. Um, and he now serves as deputy country direct coordinator to the DRC Congo Yali network uh, and is pursuing a master's degree in social sciences with a specialization in global politics, economy, governance and security at Birkbeck College at the University of London. So thank you, Henry, and over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you, Makani. I'm pleased to be here and thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, before I start, I'd love to uh, request a moment of silence to uh, think of the people uh, affected by the volcanic eruption in my country, in the Eastern Congo. Um, not only that, but all the uh, tragedies that have been going ongoing for the past uh, two decades if you may allow that.
Thank you very much. Okay, um, well, uh, yeah, I don't know. After four days of uh, uh, intensified engagement and uh, uh, invigorating sessions with uh, previous uh, uh, both speakers to different sessions, it was a little bit hard for me to come up with uh, uh, a specific remark. And uh, in place, uh, I, I'm having a lot of questions. That's how I was like, maybe I will be sharing these questions. And uh, from the time we'll be engaging on these topics, probably we'll be also drafting solutions for the Africa that we want to see 20 years down from now. And maybe also to reflect on the YALI and how we envision it uh, for the coming years. And here goes questions I had on my mind. On my mind, it's like how comfortable we as a, the current and future leaders of this continent. How comfortable are we with the current political power narrative across the continent? Like after decades of ambitious to. To, to reach democratic status across uh, African countries. After decades of rich elections, which most of the time we got from our wrong or, or forced revolutions, have we managed to incorporate this exogen concept as indicators driving us to, to what the Africa we would love to become future generations? Like, I don't know, but what is corruption and how different is corruption from lobby? And what is good for Africa? How good has the humanitarian or the development model been to Africa and how wrong? Or why shouldn't you try the Chinese approach on the continent? How fair is the fact that sometimes students from the Southern universities cannot access or they have limited access to intellectual properties or content produced within northern university, even when research and field, I mean, even when field research was carried on the continent. How fair is that? We as alumni, YALI alumni, current and future leaders of this continent, as we claim changes, and most of the times the narrative is based on leaders who overstay in power. What is our genuine offer? What is different? What is, what is new? What is, what is the offer that we are taking, that we are putting on the table? My point here is that we, we need to rethink uh, the African current political narrative. One side, leadership. On the other side, the power concept, which goes with economy and finances. I really think there is, there is need for us as the elite African future to think of a new model of democracy from an African perspective. We need to identify what exactly will work best for us. We've been trying this model for the past five decades. It has not been working and we got to accept that has proven its limitations. As we do celebrate 10 years of this novel initiative, first milestone assessment, the projection to me is which type of Africa we envision 20 years from now. And to answer this, as I said, I, I was, maybe we should start by thinking, how did our forefathers manage to live as one people, as a neighbor? maybe not nations, but how did they manage to keep that coherence between them before we have to get to the third uh, wave of pseudo-democratization and everything that we are now living. For me, I envision a self-sustained, financially autonomous African Union led by African leaders and I don't doubt part of them will be Yali alumni, African leaders who believe that a summit for its economy's funding is not to be held in Paris. That is only one case, which is almost a recent. An Africa which decide on how and when we intervene under protect, under responsibility to protect an independent African mentally and financially. An Africa 
with a share, with a seat around the United Nations Security Council table. We do not have, we do not have to feel the need to align ourselves just because we participated to the YALI so we cannot explore other side of concepts which do not align with the pre the preconcised Western model of development or democracy. Finally, Yali, I think we are on a good track. And to conclude, I would like to recognize previous speakers who have joined the political sphere, who have joined the decision-making table. And I hope with the time, as we keep discussing on this topic, we need to embrace more and more, not only the concept of think tanks, but also things and do. We need to embrace the action, um, the change action approach. Thank you. Henry, for, for those exciting uh, opening comments and, um, you know, for reflecting on, you know, the hardships um, in Eastern Cong Congo DRC at the moment. So thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to, to give a few opening comments as well, uh, just to stimulate some dialogue and um, conversation. Uh, and, you know, as I'm speaking, feel free to, to add some comments or thoughts into the chat, you know, for those of you who are attending. Um, first, I'd like to speak to uh, sort of the Africa that, that I envision 20 to 30 years from now. Um, you know, ideally, you know, I would hope to see a continent that is prosperous, peaceful, and democratic, and really putting uh, youth at the forefront and giving them a seat at the table. Uh, I'd like to see an Africa that magnifies the entrepreneurial spirit and dynamism of women and young people. And USAID would like to see democratic advancement on the part of African governments and citizens, civil society, and the private sector holding their governments um, accountable um, and for being responsive to the needs of the citizenry. Um, and so this, you know, the future should include uh, citizen-centered governance and respect for human rights. And these are values that, um, that we hold in common, uh, I think, across all of our societies. Uh, in terms of some of the core challenges to implementing that vision, um, uh, there are several, and you know, there, we'll have to think about what actions can be put in place to help realize that vision. You know, we're dealing with a situation where there's a global youth bulge. Um, there is a rise in violent extremism around the world. You know, these aren't just the youth bulge. I think is, is significant in Africa, but the extremism issue is a global issue. You know, that we're facing here at home and uh, in the United States, uh, but also on the continent. Uh, the continent's facing high you know, uh, uh, youth unemployment uh, and um, you know, underinvestment in, in employment for young people. Um, educated, um, healthy, and civically engaged young people are critical to driving economic growth and prosperity. And YALI directly responds to those issues by putting young people at the forefront to address those challenges and really building their capacity to create innovative solutions. So, you know, in recent years, you know, we've seen some backsliding uh, globally uh, on democracy and respect for human rights, um, you know, globally and on the continent as well. And I think there's still enthusiasm for good government um, and, and support for that, but we need to support democratic advancement uh, and hold each other mutually accountable um, so that citizens and civil society in the private sector um, can stand up and, and, and really demand um, support from their governments. Um, and we need to pay close attention to free and fair elections uh, and attempts at manipulation uh, and lack of respect for democratic norms and media freedoms. Um, and you know, try to work towards a space where there's greater government transparency and accountability. Now, YALI participants um, are at the forefront of these efforts. Um, you all who are here today are, are, are the ones who are on the ground fighting the fight um, to advance these values and to put in place systems that are responsive to your local communities uh, and that work for each of your societies. You know, we talk about the continent of Africa, 
we're talking about 54 different countries. You know, there's not one framework that will fit. But I think um, pushing forward towards in the spirit of our common values can yield the kinds of solutions that even though they may be slightly tailored to the unique country settings and cultures that that are you know um, diverse you know across the continent um, would still be um, centered and grounded in those in those common values. Um, so, in terms of you know where USA fits into all of this, you know we are committed to continuing to support the regional leadership centers and their ability to support. Um, alumni and the network and um, new folks to come in and get the tools that they need and build the relationships that are important to um, you know building the societies that that we want to see on the continent. Um, we're moving to unify the four regional leadership centers so that there's greater cohesion across the regions uh, and to train strength and support um, for the 20,000 plus alumni. Um, you know, this will enable us to mobilize greater resources for sustained leadership training and to support more young people uh, on the continent. So deepening engagement with marginalized communities will remain a priority for us, uh, as well as engaging uh, new partners to further our reach into, into marginalized communities on the continent um, you know, as we go. So our commitment is there. Uh, I think the mutual values are there. And I think it's a question of really, you know, supporting and strengthening the network um, of folks who are on the ground at the forefront to, to really do that work and, and forge ahead. So thank you. Um, okay, so with that, we wanted to uh, open up the chat. Um, so we do have a question from Gibson. Um, see if I can read it. It says, um, can we address the following challenges and what we see as the way forward? And so the challenges were lack of contestable provision of public service, failure to enable, just make it a little bigger so I can read it, failure to enable the private sector such as downsourcing, downsizing, outsourcing and partnership? I think that's the question. So Henry, do you have some thoughts on, um, you know, some of the challenges around failure to enable the private sector and lack of provisioning for public services? Uh, I think you need to unmute. the microphone button on the left. Um, can you, do you see the microphone icon, Henry, on the, it's right under your camera icon on the left side of the screen? So, yeah, no, I see you speaking, um, but I still don't, uh, we still can't hear you. You may have to uh re-log in or something um let me let me try to answer the question a bit while you're figuring out your your volume um so you know part of the issue with public services and um you know enabling of the of the private sector so far as i can understand the question and gibson feel free to uh, jump back into the chat if I'm not understanding the question clearly. Um, you know, it really does come down to resources 
you know, like, is there uh, enough funding to prioritize uh, public services and the provision of public services? Um, and is there, um, you know, how can the government do a good job of enabling the private sector and, you know, promoting its development without over-regulating and sort of over, you know, or creating systems that disincentivize innovation and development? Um, and and uh, apologies for, for the pings, if you can hear that. Um, but I mean, these are all things that require strong governance and um, you know, a civil service that understands how these systems work and is able to mobilize resources and support to their societies to get it done. So, I mean, the capacity building for public management um, really doesn't, I think, get enough attention um, there's um, now, I think, appropriate attention to entrepreneurship and SME development, um, you know, for people to be able to explore, you know, the business and enterprise. And I think that's getting the right level of attention because a vibrant private sector is critical for economic growth. And the SME segment in particular has a lot of needs and financially and capacity building wise. But I, the, the public management side is, is just as critical. Uh, and I think strengthening the ability of public sector, uh, folks who work in the public side of it to be able to work in complementarity with the private sector and also to um, you know, be able to get the resources to the point where you're actually executing on the provision of public services is what leads to material improvements in the lives of the citizenry. Um, so I do think there needs to be greater emphasis on ensuring that public servants have the tools, people in public management have the tools, whether they're working in government or whether they're working for multilateral organizations. I mean, there are different levels to this or even in the regulatory space uh, to be able to, wherever they are in the system, be able to be as effective as they can be. So that's what uh, I would say on that. So let me see. Um, what else is coming through the chat? So Johnny, I see you're saying uh, in 10 years, I'm seeing Africa finally taking off in this journey for development, but to reach the level we need to go back to the drawing board, um, we need to redesign things and come up with new innovations and ideas. Um, yeah, and that and that innovation needs to be, I think, based on the lived experience of folks um, within each of the societies that they're operating in. Um, you know, I think countries, you know, just taking a standard template and applying it without contextualizing the challenges, without contextualizing things um, within the society won't succeed in the long run. If people don't have ownership, don't feel some sense of ownership of their systems of governance and a sense of, you know, you know, that their government is there for them and is supporting them in some way. So, you know, I do agree with Johnny that um, coming up with new ways to ensure accountability, transparency, um, you know, there are digital solutions now um, that can help to create that kind of transparency, transparency in procurement. Where's the money going? You know, is it really going to serve citizens? How do how do um, how do we convey information? You know, about what our what our governments are doing in service of, of the citizenry, so that people have the information and are empowered to to demand more and to and to ask for for improvements and greater efficiencies. Um, so I think definitely the old way of doing things can use improvement. Um, there are new solutions out there that are you know, interesting and, and, and dynamic um, and ways that can bring in more people into the system and get them engaged in driving solutions. Welcome back, Henry. Henry, can you hear me? 
Okay, I, I now I can hear you now, but you're sounding very faint. Looks like the headphones weren't quite working. Looks like, um, so Henry, are you still there? Have you just tried to uh, turn off your video to see if it helps with your audio? Okay, I hear something, I hear a click. Henry, can you try speaking again? Oh, I heard your sigh. Henry, I think it's working. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're trying to get Henry up and running. But you know, I'd like to ask the audience, I mean, Johnny brings up um, the need for innovation. I mean, what are you seeing in your societies that can promote innovation? You know, is anything working? You know, what transparency mechanisms are helping uh, people to be more engaged and aware of um, what's happening in the public management sector and how we can improve um, transparency and accountability in the public management sector. So if any of you have thoughts on that, you know, I'd welcome, I'd welcome your, your, your adding it to the chat and, and hearing, you know, how the YALI program can also um, continue to support those things uh, in a better way. Okay, Henry, are you there? A little bit, yeah, much better. Uh, try again. Yeah, sorry for that. I think it was well, my headphone not working at all anymore. Um, I don't know if I may take back on the uh, question uh, from Gibson, and uh, I, I would love to share my my enthusiasm. And uh, I, I do really believe in the power of uh, 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 private public approach in development. But still, uh, there is something that we need to question again: is our position and how innovative we are in uh, learning from the experience we were exposed to in Af in, uh, in America, for example, or in um, uh, the Western world, and how they fit within our context. Now, everything that we get um, uh, in the Western should or uh, is to apply within the African context. Uh, the African context. I do also believe that we should be more of more of the types of a citizen who demand accountability from their uh, uh, leaders, as you uh, you mentioned before. So um, I, I really do think it's a, it's a double edged uh, fight. On one side, we got to have a, a accountable leader. On the other side, we are the person to be demanding accountability from our leaders. On the other side, we have the responsibility to get to play. There is already a large number of entrepreneurs and um, YALI alumni uh, having uh, doing wonderful uh, uh, work, uh, businesses to, uh, uh, to charities. But there is uh, the place, I mean, uh, where we need to, to, to invest more is uh, uh, how we create that platform, collaborative platform between one side, uh, the leaders, and on the other side, we citizens who demand from um, uh, our leaders. Uh, on, on public services, it's a little bit challenging because these are not things that we, we, we should believe in politicians when they approach us and promising things that cannot be achieved within a, a single term or within less than a reasonable time framework. And again, we have responsibility here to take action and not wait until 
these people step in because most of the sorry most of these politicians are quite politicians and they are not uh, uh, men who think of the need of their uh, uh, people like Churchill said uh, politicians think of um, uh, the next elections while statement they think of uh, next five generations the people thinking of the five next generations should not only be the people sitting within public offices. You and I as uh, activists, you and I as entrepreneurs, you and I as uh, motivators can also ignite that, uh, um, uh, that energy and bring about the, uh, uh, the change and the, uh, the services that our, uh, our people need. That's my take on that. One interesting thing too is um, what is the pathway that people take, you know, in their careers? I think often in the past, there's been a feeling like, oh, you know, once you graduate, you get a government job, you stay in a government job for 30, 40 years, then you retire to your farm and you <laughs> in the in your village and, you know, then you're good to go. You've served. Um, but I do wonder if, you know, how quickly, con you know, that, model is evolving where people are taking the time to go be entrepreneurs or go um you know step away from government to go do other things and then coming back into government and sort of bringing that experience and that perspective of having worked in multiple sectors um and letting that sort of support their ability to um you know then shape you know how the public management piece is responsive to the needs of you know civil society, the needs of the private sector, et cetera. Um, so do you have any thoughts on sort of from you know people's perspectives on how their careers evolve and how they can be on one side or the other side as you know as they're going along? Uh, Henry, can you hear me? Okay, it looks like your sound went out again. I mean, that's also a question for the chat. Like, are there those of you in the in the chat who have um, deliberately tried to um, get roles both, um, you know, in the public space, but also in you know advocacy, nonprofit, private sector? and try to figure out how to bring your experiences to one or the other side and to have that shared experience to try to improve um, you know, public management. So just a thought, feel free to drop that into the chat as we wait for, for Henry to join us. Um, so I see a comment from Davies. People want services brought down to them, but they never participate in the planning and budgeting of public services. All activities have been left to technical persons and politicians only come in to approve and pass as per legal requirements. So I think that's a really good point. And that's a point too that I think even in the United States, um, you know, as, as the United States has been going through its own responsive to the Black Lives Matter movement over the past year, you know, a lot of the advocacy around that has been getting people engaged at the community level and going to budget meetings and going to local county council meetings and showing up and sharing with their fellow citizens what is happening in these local governance structures and to be able to have their voices heard and to influence um, how budgets are structured. Because budgets reflect priorities, right? Where the money goes, you know, that says something about what the community's priorities are. But if no citizens actually ever show up to these meetings and advocate for the things that are most important to them, then you know the folks who are in those seats have less incentive to be responsive to to that advocacy because it's just not there. And so you know I think again that's a mutual that's a that's a global challenge you know to make people aware of the spaces in which these decisions are being made and to promote proactive civic participation. Uh, it's not just about national governments. Um, it's not just about national legislative elections. These are conversations that are also critical at the local and municipal level. 
Welcome back, Henry. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, um, as you mentioned, the proper way to uh, encourage these same people sitting within official and public offices is by we citizens being demanding. Because as you mentioned, yeah, uh, a perspective, an evaluation perspective from, uh, from self, most of the time it does not always reflect uh, areas of shortcomings. And we are the people, we know exactly what we need. We know exactly what um, our priorities are. And um, maybe I will sound like escalating this uh, uh, debate. And I don't perceive this at a, a, a local or a national or, as I mentioned, a specific country. I'm considering this as a, a, a continental uh, matter. And uh, the, trend, the, trend, the trend we are currently having does not reflect uh, what we need or what we are aspiring to. As we look forward to the yearly we want to have 10 years from now or the Africa we want to um, uh, to leave behind us. Uh, the trend now is that uh, everything that Africa needs is decided elsewhere. And for us to be demanding is to start by changing that uh, mental narrative that uh, someone else in, in, in um, uh, 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 the Bretton Wood will understand better our economic and finances need. We are the people to, to fix the rule and demand on uh, the evaluation to be carried out to know how much was invested in what at which point. So uh, getting my foot together is a, uh, uh, on one side, we take it local. We demand these direct public officers that we can engage with. And on the other side, we get to understand that we have that right. We have um, uh, not right only, but the duty to engage within the, um, uh, uh, the public affairs management. Uh, the, in Congo, we, we name it um, uh, Le Vivre Tranquille. It's like when you got your job, secure your, your, your future with your kid, then you are, you are better off. Uh, the, the, next, the next neighbor, he got to take care of himself. We got to go beyond that behavior. We got to consider ourselves as a whole. We got to start building nations and moving beyond villages, beyond families. And that is only when we can grow global or continental to claim that Africans need are to be decided, are to be identified and decided on how we affect resources by Africans. So it's like both ways, bottom down, down bottom on our behavior as individuals, how we engage within the public management um, uh, uh, responsibilities. What is our share? What is your responsibility? A, a good question I remember when I was joining Yali was when was the last time you engaged in a public management um, uh, event or activity? And you get to realize that most of the times we do consider that it's not our responsibility. And that is why we keep on uh, uh, backsliding instead of consolidating all that we have like ideals and ideas. How can, um, how do you see the YALI network um, being support, mutually supportive of this um, sort of nation building endeavor, right? So you say we need to get together. It's about more than just your family. It's about more than just your community. You know, at, you know African countries can be stronger with a strong national identity that allows them to leverage collective resources for a greater empowerment within their countries, but also globally. So what, what, is the YALI, what do you think the YALI network can do to be mutually supportive of each other in doing that work um, you know, from the public sphere, but also from other spheres at all, uh, as well? Well, yeah, that, that's a very good uh, question. The thing, as I mentioned, I think we are already on a good trend, but it's only that we are adopting ideals on uh, realities which are not genuinely ours. Uh, 
Yali uh, from a personal assessment, from a personal direct network. I already have a lot of, a good number of friends who have joined uh, the public offices and who are quite well positioned to make decisions playing in the good favor of the majority. But uh, the thing is, uh, and uh, the model, the model that we have adopted is not fully thought to meet the African context or current reality. Yali is, is a strength, and I, I, I love the, uh, the systemic approach that we have, because I do consider my friend in Sudan as having quite the same issues as we do have in Congo. And when we, we, we exchange on these issues, we tend to have the same uh, mindset that we, we, we see or the models we got exposed to during our um, uh, different experiences, especially the Yali uh, uh, experience. My call today is uh, for the Yali to, to really think of uh, what is our current situation, what has been presented to us, how does this fit our, um, our context. I think that is where we are still uh, um, uh, lagging backwards. Uh, I'll provide an, 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 uh, an example. Uh, a country like Uganda, uh, this is a country um, economically, I'm not an expert, but I think Uganda is doing well. And the only scene is that Museveni has been in power for too long. But thinking from an African perspective, should that be really a problem after we have experienced within our recent history? Libya was doing quite well with a living standard almost equal to some of the European countries. Then one of the reasons, others reason maybe we are not addressing them right now, was that Gaddafi was in power for too long and he had to go. Where is Libya now? Libya is chaos. We need to now sit and consider food on the table or democracy and elections. We have been having elections and the democracy. The next day we are on the streets. The next day diplomacy plays it. And he swears it. My issue is how we do conciliate the economic force with a model which will work best for us. That is where I'm inviting my fellow Yali to come up with uh, something genuine, something which belongs to us, something which conciliates the public officer as a citizen, as an African, and something which conciliates a public officer as a modern leader, someone who does not align, someone who considers themselves to be accountable because they hold a public seat. I'm not sure I'm making myself clear, but I think the role of Yali, starting now or 10 years ahead, is for us to come up with uh, uh, this systemic uh, 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 solutions as into how we conciliate our reality to what is the ideal and what works best for us. For us. You know, and I think it is about um, creative, innovative, innovative solutions, you know, at the local level that account for, for, for local structures and how they operate. Um, you know, someone asked a question in the chat, you know, about how I think about other ways to create local accountability. Um, you know, and I remember, you know, several years ago um, when the now WTO Director General Ngozi Okonjo Iwala was um, finance minister, one of the things that she did that was super important was to actually publicly publish the federal budget and, you know, how much money was going to states and when those transfers were happening so that people finally had some transparency as to the amount of money that was moving, you know, between the federal government and the states, and then they could, you know, decide how they wanted to hold states accountable for the spending of those federal dollars. I mean, something quite literally that simple that had never happened and was revolutionary in terms of, you know, people finally going, oh, that's what's going on. 
Um, and, and, you know, you think about it in retrospect, you're like, yeah, it seems kind of basic, right? People should know something like that, but it hadn't been done, you know, on a consistent basis. She was the first one to really, you know, really make that push for even the, those kinds of basic levels of transparency and accountability by just publishing the numbers. Um, so, you know, it's not, uh, it doesn't have to be rocket science, I think, to, to come up with localized solutions that promote accountability and transparency, but it does have to take, you know, Congolese working in Congo to say this, we know how our government works, we know how it operates. And, you know, how then do we give citizens access to the information they need? Um, where's, you know, where, where are the decision points that are operating in our local system so that we can make sure that what the government is doing represents the values of the citizenry? Um, and so, I think it's really about creating, you know, in spaces like the RLCs, I, I think are really great because people coming together from across countries can share, you know, what's working for me. You know, maybe somebody in, you know, in one country hasn't had the idea yet in terms of, you know, how do I do this? But, you know, somebody coming from another country has says, oh, you know, we tried these five things. This is what worked for us. And then people can say, okay, we'll try those five things too. It might, you know, it might work differently in our context for whatever reason. Um, but I think having those spaces, those pan-African spaces to have those conversations and promote ideation and promote innovative thinking and share what's being piloted and explored um, is really the value of a network like the Yali Network. Um, you know, it's getting people out of their silos, their sector silos, their geographic silos to be able to say, there's a lot happening in the world and get exposure to some of those things and bring some of those solutions home and adapt them locally um, in the spirit of continuous improvement, in the spirit of transparency and accountability and improvement of services to the citizenry. Um, let's see, so yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> good chat. Um, it is. Um, so we have, uh, Let's see what's happening. I see some uh, back and forth. How do you hear? Okay, somebody was asking, how do you hear about Yali? Um, that well, there's I think a lot. There's a website, you know, Twitter, Facebook. I mean, I think the Yali network has an incredible, I think, Facebook presence as well. Um, and so, you know, the I think folks can can join there as uh, and to be a part of it. The alumni associations are completely run by alumni, so I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that, Henry, in terms of how the alumni groups um, get the word out on your side. Well, I think I do think part of the mobilization is uh, um, uh, is that the post programming um, uh, or the Africa-based program is something that uh, is uh, demonstrating how is. Uh, how are Yali alumni taking uh, responsibility, taking charge? Um, across uh, Africa, a few countries are visited. There are vibrant organizations, there are vibrant alumni with uh, um, constantly and um, uh, uh, impactful uh, activities. Uh, so uh, Yali alumni uh, in Congo, I can consider this as a uh, like, we do have uh, initiatives on a monthly basis to carry out community services days, which is uh, uh, an individual uh, and it keeps on improving and uh, increasing awareness uh, about the Yali. And, uh, these examples are, are, are many across countries. There are also the virtual uh, dimension. You have uh, uh, a quite good presence of uh, uh, Yali different virtual platform, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Uh, I do think there are uh, really uh, a good, a good uh, Yali network is doing good in terms of uh, um, increasing awareness about the initiative and translating what we learn during the program into um, action benefiting communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I know like the RLCs also have are on social media themselves, the individual RLCs. So there are ways to connect, you know, the, yeah. what social media platforms you're on um, directly to those RLCs um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, so there's a 
question here for you, Henry. It says, um, uh, the country I live in is ruled by stick and probably um, some other African countries where every effort on demanding accountability is controlled with an iron fist. Um, and, and so he's mentioning basically that you know, authority, there's greater levels of authoritarianism. Um, you know, how, how do we, I guess the question is, how do you drive for accountability when um, you're dealing with authoritarian, increasing levels of authoritarianism and crackdowns on you know, free speech and liberty? Any thoughts there? Well, um, I wish I had a proper answer to that, and I don't want to sound very idealistic, but um, I live in the Congo for what you know about the Congo for the past decade. It has been uh, really repressive and violent. But we do not always need a violent answer to a violent um, uh, action. Repression in Africa has been uh, uh, used by uh, several leaders as a mean of consolidating their powers. And I'm sorry about what's happening in Tigray is also something that we can uh, translate to uh, regional or the continental democracy, uh, uh, diplomacy. Because I, I do believe if we, we, we did have a, a strong African Union, these are actually cases which goes directly as part of attribution to the African Union. But for the time, the, 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 the horrible things have been happening in Tigran and seeing that nothing has been uh, done to, 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 to limit uh, what is happening there is really concerning. On the other side, questioning uh, what has been happening in other countries where um, uh, Western and other uh, Orient powers have their direct interest. Um, sometimes the solution is found within days. So um, I'm a bit uh, uh, not precise in my answer, but first, I would consider nonviolence actions to re as a response to um, uh, repression. We did that in Congo and we had a few victories. You do not always have to respond to violence by violence. Sometimes a nonviolent Secondly, I believe we, we as Africans need to seriously invest into uh, having a solid and strong African Union. Otherwise, waiting for the United Nations to be restored. United Nations Security Council, these people do have their priorities. And African priorities sometimes, when they do not reflect their interest, their direct interest, it takes longer and people lose lives. It's on ours to militate peacefully, to have a strong African Union capable of addressing questions like what is happening in the region of the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, um, I think these are very, very, very difficult issues. Um, people are putting their lives on the line in order to speak out um, and communicate to the broader community the challenges that they're facing, the repression, um, the suppression of civil society. You know, all these things are are, are very real, very present. And, um, and yeah, people are literally putting their lives on the line to do this work and to advocate for their communities. Um, USAID, you know, through various programs, has channeled support to civil society, you know, ele tried to elevate the stories where uh, it made sense, you know, didn't add, you know, endanger uh, people's lives to, to elevate their story and their work so that, you know, that kind of international um, attention could potentially um, give them some breathing room to continue to advocate. Um, but these are very complex um, challenges with no easy solutions. Um, but I think it is, it is a question of 
you know, working together to get the message out, working together to leverage the diaspora to you know, support um, some of this work as well and do that outreach. Um, you know, I often think, uh, you know, when it comes to some of this work, uh, we, you know, the RLCs are doing a fantastic job of trying to link Africans across borders because the issues are, are so much in common. Um, and I, I think that what uh, globally, you know, I think what from the U.S. perspective, the Black Lives Matter movement has shown is that these issues aren't just uh, limited to one continent. The challenges, some of these challenges are actually things that can actually be discussed, you know, across continents as well with advocates in the United States, advocates in Europe, advocates on the continent who um, to have different flavors, but oftentimes some of those root challenges are, are rooted in similar things. Um, and so I think part of the solution is also, again, breaking out of those silos of, oh, you know, I'm only talking to advocates in my country and really thinking more globally about the diaspora, about challenges that are happening around the world and coming together as a global community of advocates centered in common values, um, you know, demanding accountability from governments and responsiveness. And I think there's power that comes from being part of those larger networks and again, innovation and ideas um, so that others can also support, you know, what, what the messaging that's coming out of your local community um, as well. So just uh, food for thought there um, for, for everyone. Um, so we're coming uh, to the end entirely too quickly. Uh, it's already 1029. Henry, did you have some final thoughts um, for this session? Uh, a final thought is, uh, um, uh, again, a, an appeal to the Yali. Uh, let's think in a, in, a, in a sense that we have been exposed to these brilliant models, uh, which has been working, that they have been working elsewhere. What is our context? How can we learn from this experience, contextualize them, and apply them? within our context. Let us stop this uh, uh, behavior copy-pasting copy concepts and try to force them to work. Um, some of these models have shown their limitations long, long way ago. The Yali, especially those joining directly, uh, those directly joining uh, public services. This is an appeal to you. Uh, we already have been exposed to these very nice models. How do we innovate them to fit our context? What is the new political offer that we have for our people? To those in civic engagement and uh, other uh, sectors, investment, or entrepreneurship, liberal, what is our share as citizens, not only to our countries, but also as Africans? What is our share in building the Africa we want to see 20 years from now? This is the only way, as you mentioned, by moving out of these silos that we can get to the point whereby we apply solutions which work in this country and applicable to other uh, other countries as for consolidating a continental development. Thank you. Um, and with that, uh, we uh, must come to a close. Um, but again, we welcome your thoughts on you know what, how we keep moving things forward. You know how the RLCs and, and the alumni network can um, continue to support this movement engage people in public service and public management. I think it's a, it's a critical part of the equation, you know, for the African continent, in addition to our entrepreneurs and our advocates and, and so on. And so it's, uh, it takes the whole system to, to, to really, you know, be successful and accountable in the long term. So thank you to everyone who has joined us today. At 1040, please go back to, um, the uh, plenary session, we'll be doing a readout from these different breakouts on the different um, uh, paths uh, of the RLCs. And so um, take a little break and at 40 minutes after the hour, uh, we'll start again uh, in the plenary session. So thank you, Henry, uh, for your time today. It's been a pleasure to be in dialogue with you. It's been a pleasure to be in dialogue with the audience. Thanks to everyone 
who um, put some comments in. We've recorded those and we'll take those into account as well. Uh, so have Thank a really you. great conference and rest of your day. Thank you for having me.